<clears throat> so good morning, everybody. My name is Louise van Rijn, and I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to be on this call today with all of you. Uh, many of you know Paul from some other parts of your life. Some of you don't know Paul because you're part of the Symphonia network and you just got the, net, the the invitation from that or maybe you're on the African leadership group or on the champions there's lots of possibilities here mm. and it's just so lovely that that this whole community is coming back into this place and um we're going to hear from just a few of you to just say something about what happened in your breakout room but I want to say welcome Paul to my home and to my office and Thank you. uh Paul I got to know Paul in the SOODN goodness, that was a long time ago, 15 years ago or something. And uh, Craig Yatman, who's also on the call, was part of that conversation. And to then discover that Paul has written this book, which we're going to talk about, um, Character Insights for a Regenerative Future, was just a wonderful discovery. But let me quickly create an opportunity for a few of you to say what happened in your breakout room, anything that struck you about what happened in the breakout room. And the way that you indicate you want to talk is you just unmute yourself. And I'll... I'll pass the microphone over to you. So anybody want to share something about what happened in your breakout room? Nobody? This one will go, why is this so quiet? <laughs> okay, Kuba, thank you. So we'll hear from two I've, more. Just, I've just realized the importance of conversations like this. Um, we often in our busy schedules have this deep yearning for meaningful conversation and for connection. And then people you reach out to are on a different uh, um, planet. They don't necessarily have the needs that you have. But I know that all of us here tomorrow, this morning are like-minded souls. So this is my selfish time. This is my me time where I come to be fed. And I'm not even feeling guilty about that. I should have had chocolate and champagne. <laughs> because um yeah this is yeah. i can catch up on emails later and and whatever yeah. um has to be done but i feel deliciously selfish that's fantastic Kuba. we had a so kuba is joining us are you in the northern cape today are you in uppington today kuba kuba is joining us from the northern cape she's one of our partners for possibility uh, she's been in the partners possibility team for many years uh kuba i had a client the other day who said um, I, I asked for feedback after a workshop and she said, it was all fabulous. And she said, I, I give this course a 12 out of 10, but we need chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and then she continued, she said, in the afternoons at about three o'clock, we need dark chocolate. <laughs> so I've decided that from now on, I'm going to put on the packing list that Jolene does dark chocolate for three o'clock in the afternoon for every time we do a flawless consulting workshop. But we should have dark chocolate uh, when we have great conversations and ideally chocolate and bubbles. Thank you, Kuba. Anybody else want to share something about what struck you? Any thoughts from your breakout room? Are you also desperate to hear from Paul that you don't want to speak? <laughs> I'm watching. I'm watching for anybody. Oh, no, nobody's unmuting themselves. So, uh, Paul Stienkamp. Paul, these some of the people on this call know you. They've they've walked a journey with you, but but many have no idea who you are. <laughs> And I'm not going to try and introduce you. And Seth Lee is now sitting here. Seth Lee is working on personal branding. And he's going to listen very intently when Paul tells him, tells us a little bit about yourself. Just give us your kind of this, the five-minute su high-level summary of Paul Stienkow. Thank you, Louise. It's such fun to be in your home. I, I think maybe if I could just take half a step back, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity, you and Jolene, and, and for the work that you do at Symphonia. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your interest in this work. I want to thank everyone who's on the call today. I'm very humbled that you've taken the time to be with us today. I imagine that uh, the tailwinds that brought you are probably Louise and Jolene related, but um, but nonetheless, thank you so much for your attention and your interest, and also to Sikhle for helping to market the event and um, help, helping me prepare. I, I, I like to joke and say it's always so nice to be invited to speak uh, publicly because no one at home is at all interested in anything I have to say. You must be careful. I'm sure I'm sure Janine is on this call. She's, she's gonna she's, she's, she's listening. She's probably in therapy. Um so um but so it's really wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Um so quickly a little bit about myself. Um I was born in Zimbabwe in 1975, quite a long time ago. Um I'm one of three kids, two older sisters, absolutely brilliant humans. 
Um, I grew up as a young boy. I was a lot lamaki, and uh, uh, and so I spent a lot of time on my parents' lap. And I was always interested that you know so many of the adults in my life were quite frustrated at work. Um, and it, I, I found this counterintuitive as a young boy because I thought, well, you spend so much time there. Um, surely there are different ways that you could be uh, expressing yourself at work and, and enjoying your experience and. It also so happened that my mom was in personnel management, as it was called at the day. She was a, a personnel administrator at OK Bazaars. She she joined out of university in 1964, and she retired in 1997 from the Hyperama. I spent many um, holidays and weekends at her work with her. She was quite a maternal, well, she's still with us, but at work, she was quite a maternal figure. She did a great job of improving people's experience at work. So I was quite inspired by her. And um, so uh, I was the only child who was lucky enough to go to university. My folks could only afford to send one of us. My sisters were expected to marry someone who had gone to university. Um, and um, because in those days, you know, it was the cosmic lottery ticket. I was the, I was the, I was the boy. Um, and so I got to go. I was lucky enough to study uh, what was called industrial psychology at the time. Now organizational psychology had a ball doing that. Um, I worked at Cap Gemini in Europe um, uh, in, in, in human resources. And that was my first job in the UK and Ireland. Um, it was a wonderful experience because I worked in the business consulting division. Um, and so I got a lot of exposure to uh, the business world quite quickly in my career. Um, I, I was lucky to uh, you know, earn a bit of money. I wasn't in any kind of relationships or anything at the time. I put that aside. I did some backpacking. And just before I left for my backpacking trip, um, I was handed a copy of a book called The Artist's Way by a lady called Julia Cameron. And uh, for those of you who it's aren't... here somewhere. Yeah. Okay, there it is. Great. Oh, amazing. Okay. So there we go. You can show that. So there we go. Here it is. The Artist's Way. This was my travel uh, companion. Um and uh, I was determined to travel alone because I had spent most of my life uh, either in deep relationships with sport or pubs or friends uh, and, I, uh, and or girlfriends. And I didn't really know myself that well. Um, and the, the artist way is basically a 12 week course in, 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 in uh, recovering and nurturing your inherent creativity um, and getting to know yourself. And um, I, I probably completed the artist way a number of times while I was traveling. Um, and I, I, um, and I thought, wow, wouldn't this be, wouldn't it be nice to help people express their creativity at work, sort of bring together these um, two interests of mine. When I returned to South Africa, I was a, 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 a broke uh, poet and playwright by then. I'd, I'd been expressing my creativity whilst traveling. And I was a junior bookseller at uh, Exclusive Books in in uh, in Johannesburg and so that's the time that uh, my wife and I fell in love so she definitely didn't um, marry me for my money uh, and landed up joining a project management company which was in hyper growth uh, at the time uh, that whole project management wave was breaking and I was trained as a facilitator and I'm incredibly grateful for that chapter because I've really used those skills um, since then and um, and that's when I realized I love great questions better than great answers. That's one of the reasons why I love you. Um, because you can ask me one or two questions over lunch that I often have to pay for. And then I spend months trying to figure out what the answer to those questions are. But I love shows like Graham Norton and uh, I love talk radio and things like that, where they're just great questions and great conversations. And I think that's what good facilitation is all about. Um, and I landed up starting my own facilitation business. and. Um, and one of my first gigs was to do a strategy for a, a, a couple of people that were starting what we didn't know at the time as a change management business. And uh, it was good chemistry. And lo and behold, they offered me a, a co-foundership in this startup. And uh, I did that for five years. Uh, a wild ride, uh, as successful as it was, uh, it was also a complete disaster. And I limped into FNB as head of change in 2008 in the wake of the global uh, financial crisis. I just have to stop you there. Yeah, yeah. All this background. Oh, okay. And it's so interesting. I'm sure many people on the call. So I really want to invite people, if you are, if you have any response to what 
what Paul says. We are going to be trying to be disciplined around hearing your voice, but please share in the chat any thoughts. Because I was just, if I was now in a chat, I would have kind of, oh my goodness, I didn't know all that background about you. That's why I like you so much. So there's such, all this, in, all this kind of, you, you know, our journeys are so interesting. We do need to spend some time just hearing everybody's journeys. Mm. So I'm, I met you in, in F and B. So I want you to continue yeah. the story, but the story before F and B is so yeah. interesting. Thank you for sharing that. I remember um, our first meeting. It you shared a story about um, one of the big epiphanies in your career. And I'm sorry if I'm butchering this. I maybe should have rehearsed this with you, you before, man. But uh, you said one of your biggest ahas was somebody called you out after you had finished your PhD and said, uh, "In in in your absolute certainty, you've left no space for my uncertainty." It was something along those lines. Yes, the, the woman said, Karen Van Stone. She said, uh, "When you are so certain, there is no space for my voice." Oh right. And what I need you okay. to do is to hold certainty more lightly. Yeah, that yeah. wasn't a yeah. For sure. It was great, and that was one of many that I've had, um, you know, in, in the encounters that we've had together. So thank you for that. And um, anyway, so when you I, joined yeah, F&B, I, joined F&B. Uh, I limped into that job and uh, head of change and then realized that, you know, there, there, there wasn't really a change management practice at F&B. There never really was going to be one because at the time it was a real owner manager culture and the bosses said, you know, this is what we're doing. And, you, you know, it was a FIFO fit in or, you know, you know what kind of scenario so there was no need to convince people to to change if they didn't want to change they were shown the door um and so it, it, luckily i came across this innovation program that they were running with their employees as part of my mm -hmm. orientation or induction and it was like a lightning strike i was like oh here it is it's creativity at work so um i signed up as 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 a participant it was all over and above your day job and then eventually as a champion and then I was lucky enough to be asked to um, eventually that, run that program, and, and the sponsor was this highly charismatic Michael Yudan, who I, uh, you know, have to, happily married, very uh, com comfortable in my relationship, but a huge man crush on him. My wife is aware, still have it. Um, but this ultimate flame carrier for this topic of why innovation was important, and I mean, Michael took over this dog of a bank. It was one of four high street banks at the time. It was completely untransformed. It was stone lost in terms of its return on equity that was delivering. It had been run by Anglo-American, a bit like a mine, um, for, for many years. And uh, he had this vision to turn it into the most innovative bank in the world. It took him 10 years. And him and I crossed paths about five years into that journey. I inherited a lot of tailwinds from giants that came before me in that programmatic space. Um, and I was just, it was just, uh, uh, it's synchronistically, it just uh, it was just a purple patch of my career, and we, we, we had a had a wonderful experience there. I mean, I was still running the change practice, and um, and I was doing employee value proposition work for them as well. But um, that's how FMB used to reward you. They didn't increase your salary; they just gave you more things to do. <laughs> fun things to do, uh, yeah, yeah, fun things to do. Um, but I'll always be grateful for that opportunity, and um, and that basically changed my life. That role. Um, and I felt like for the first time I was on purpose and I saw people with bright eyes and bushy tails um, sort of pushing through their frustrating day jobs, but then being really energized by the innovation projects that they were kind of driving through discretionary effort over and above their day jobs. And, and, um, and it was incredibly rewarding to finally be working in the OE or, or de development space and, and driving real employee engagement and change. We were creating jobs. And I think we were enabling lives and businesses at scale. It was really exciting. And then Standard Bank phoned and they said, Michael was on his way out. Uh, Jacques Soulez was taking over. He was probably the secret source to the FNB innovation story. He was actually the guy behind the scenes that was delivering a lot of the magic, incredible leader. Um, and he wanted to leave a different legacy, an engineering legacy at FNB. And just so happened, I got a call from Standard Bank saying, we got a bit of a blood nose on the innovation front. I think a number of the other banks felt the same way. FNB had really uh, pulled ahead on that topic. Then a bank had been going through this poor banking transformation and it had this own kind of gravitational pull that had take, distracted them from their customers and their colleagues and their communities. And they wanted to get back on track. So, um, yeah, I was very honored to go and join them and help try and build out some innovation capability. Had a good start and then completely porked it. 
you know, I thought the, the job was to put some innovation runs on the board, but actually the job was, it was a culture change gig. And the African adage of, uh, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others, uh, was something that I completely lost sight of. And I just pushed too hard, too fast. Um, and, uh, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, technically, I don't think I'm allowed to say I was fired. Um, but, uh, they asked me to look for other roles inside the business and, uh, and, and I was in the retail bank and the investment bank were quite keen to, for me to come across, but I felt like I had just burned out actually. Um, and, and also, you know, hadn't played the politics at all well. So I started my own company, Jack Frost in 2016, an innovation and, and change consultancy, um. I like to say every successful startup is a nine-year overnight success. So we're in our seventh year now. I think we're getting closer to figuring out what the economy and our clients actually need from us and what um, they're willing to pay us to do and what we're good at doing. Um, and so Sikli and I run that business together. And um, yeah, the book. Yeah, so, so that sort of, that maybe takes us. So that's the background. Yeah. But, but Paul, I want to go back to the, the really difficult standard bank experience because yeah. I think every single one of us, and I'm thinking of many people who are joining, have joined the call. We have a, a crucible story, mm. and that in that crucible, something became clear for us mm. when we were, you know, it was a horrible experience for you, mm. and 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 it's easy to kind of go over it. Mm. But when I read the book, I read, I read the lessons that you learned from that experience, mm. and. Um, and Maleba is asking the name of your company. Can you just quickly? Oh, thanks, Maleba. Thanks for that. It's Jack Frost. And uh, so if you want to check us out online, it's I am jackfrost.com. And go. the background is Jack Frost is the uh, uh, in Norse mythology. Uh, he's, he is the god of serious play or the guardian of serious play. Uh, but he also is a super collaborator and creative problem solver. And he helps communities navigate uh, very difficult storms so we've our work is really to help uh, organizations figure out who their jack frosts are and um, to empower them to do some good collaboration and problem solving fantastic every time i hear paul speak i think oh i want, I want to come and be a be a uh a fly on the wall next time when you do a workshop maybe i will somewhere along yeah, the line maybe i'll be invited to be a fly on the wall but oh i've got a golden ticket did you hear that <laughs> keep him on that That's one and second prize is two golden tickets <laughs> seriously we're gonna have to have a conversation so but anyway so your your um um standard bank experience then forced you in in a way and i was thinking Many of the people on the call was on that call with Peter Block a few weeks ago. You were also on the call mm. around. No, no, I wasn't on the oh, you went. So, so it was a call around free, and his new book is about freedom, yeah. and and how when we are not in the shackles of the organisation and we get confronted with our own freedom, what then? Because yeah. there's something about you know I've been bought by the organisation, I've signed a employment contract, yeah. and now I have a job to do. Yeah. When you don't have a job to do and you get to do what you want to do, yeah. that's a tough ask. Yeah, it's messy, uh, it, it, especially if you haven't picked something where there's a, um, you know, it, it's a bit of a road less traveled. There isn't a well-defined playbook and there aren't, um, you know, professional development points available and um, and and, and a, com a community still growing around some of the practices and um so there, there are a lot of unknowns. Exactly. Yeah, and I think if you if you faced with that kind of freedom, hopefully you're blessed with somebody who's willing to kind of forgive you through all the kind of messiness and own goals that you land up scoring while you kind of try and get the data to learn what you should actually be doing. So also just want to give my wife a shout out so, um, and and the therapists, you know, uh, yeah, and all the people. Yeah, but I think that. And so again, if I look at if, if in my conversations with people who've done interesting things in their lives, that messiness, that liminal space, that feeling of, oh my goodness, way too from here. Um, it, when we look back at that, and and if we really kind of allowed ourselves to be in it fully, and you were in it. Yeah. But but one and when I read the book, one of the there was a moment when you were you then I think created a sense of community around you, very yeah. similar to when I came back from the UK having been part of this amazing uh, professional community 
I, I felt so lonely and I created the SAODN because I needed a community. It was for no other reason. It wasn't because, you know, I was so altruistic or anything. <laughs> I needed a community and I yeah. met people like you and Craig and many other people in the room. Uh, Liesl, the, the, the author of Freedom is um, Peter Block, who wrote Freedom and Accountability. Um, and many for many of us on this call, Peter Block is our you know, he's been a mentor and a friend and a hero and just one of those people that have changed my life. Um, but um, but anyway, sorry, I was going, let me go, come back to the, the point about um, that there was a, con so you created a community around yeah. you, which was people who are in this innovation space. Yeah. And then one day you were in a, that felt to me like a, yeah. like a defining like a moment. Big, uh -huh, yeah. T talk yeah. to, talk to us about, tell us that story. Yeah, so um, uh, I think it was Winston Churchill. Churchill who said the most personal um, uh, fears and challenges are, are, are often the most common. And um, and uh, so yeah, I mean, this was a community of practice called the Creative Leadership Collective, and the idea was it was for uh, executives who were driving change in complex organisations and innovation in complex organisations to come together and set an agenda themselves and sort of through a process of sharing and, and collective wisdom building uh, uh, try and get unstuck on some of the things that um, they were battling with um, and the topics were kind of all, you know always the same and, and probably not worth recapping because they probably were well known to people on the call but the, the aha that I had was that um, that uh, that you know great relationships uh, between people of you know good character were were actually a big part of the unlock um to to driving meaningful change inside these uh, complex organizations and as as simple as that sounds um it was just something i hadn't considered up until then i'd been quite um i'd put a lot of faith in innovation strategies change strategies methodologies practices processes um, even pieces of technology as um, you, you know uh, tools that we could use to 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 drive meaningful change but um, I, I hadn't sufficiently considered the, the role of the people involved so you know just as a, quick, a couple of quick asides I've been you know been lucky to witness and or support um, many many innovation projects inside these types of organizations and there, there is kind of a, a, a uh, I wouldn't say a hur heuristic, but a, a, almost a universal law that um, you can have great people with no resources on an innovation project and have great outcomes. You can have other innovation projects in organizations that have all the resources in the world, access to all the best practices, all the best tools, but the wrong people involved and you have a terrible outcome. So that's the one side of this, you know, that think that the, the people side of innovation and change, I don't think is getting enough attention. Um, and, and, and we're not spending enough time thinking about how do we become these kind of people and where they exist, what are they like, um, which is partly the origins of the book. But the other side of it is my experience of FNB, where, where Michael was such a, um, you know, a, an avid flame carrier for this kind of change. Um, and, um, and what a difference that made. I mean, at FMB, it was a very entrepreneurial culture at the time. So you know, we, we, we ran the innovation program on a, you know, sniff of an oil rag, you know, we, we had no budget. Um, and everyone who was running innovation projects had to kind of beg, borrow and steal um, to fund those projects out of business as usual allocations. But this, the, the, that scrappiness, um, actually forged something quite special and uh, there were a lot of runs put on the board uh, and in other experiences I've had where we've been very well resourced um, I think it's because we haven't had the kind of leadership support and all the right kind of people involved um, that we haven't had as much success and, and maybe also just the last thing to say is because I'm interested in studying people of high character I, I don't want to suggest that I'm somebody of high character um, but it, it certainly, uh, it, it, in, in sort of crunching the data and, and reflecting on my own lived experience, this seems to be the strongest golden thread um, amongst these leaders. And dare I say leaders like Brene Brown says, is anyone who has the courage, um, who, has the, who sees the potential in people and processes and has the courage to develop it. Not 
anyone sitting at a C-suite level. For sure. So it's anyone in the organization. So I think there's something, and this is why I'm excited about, was excited about firstly, even having the conversation with you. I think there's something about the scrappiness and the frugal, the idea of frugal innovation mm. that we should not underestimate. Mm. So um, one of the many books on this shelf that get me very excited is a, is a guy from America, a guy called... Um, Santiago Rincon Calado, who says that the world's problems will not be solved in Harvard or Boston. It will be solved by people in the trenches in the in the under-resourced global south who just have to figure out a solution. Mm -hmm. And I and that's why I didn't go to Harvard this year to go and study the the advanced leadership institute at the advanced leadership institute because I do think there's something really special happening mm -hmm. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I want to make a connection just because you've just made me think of something. So, so this, I love, I, we're going to talk about these five character strengths because mm. I'd be lovely yeah. for people to hear that. But yeah. there's something about um, the, the importance of relationships. Yeah. And then there's something about our story about leadership, which is what you've touched on just now. Yeah. So, so with partner responsibility for the last 13 years, we've been exploring this with with these 3,600 partner, partners who were trying to do something very difficult and had no resources and you know, all of what you're talking about. And it was around the story about leadership in South Africa is usually that leaders must know the way, show the way and give direction. And mm -hmm. what you talk about in your book and what you have mm -hmm. discovered mm -hmm. is that le great leaders of change do not try and be the, yeah. one, the superhero. They do create a space where everybody can make their best contribution. So you know that the name Symphonia comes from this idea of every voice to be heard. Mm. So, um, and then I want to quickly tell you a story that, that is linked to, which just kind of links to everything you've said. Um, when I first kind of developed Partners Possibility, I went to see um, Nick Benedel. Yeah, and I said to Nick, I've got this idea of, of partnering business leaders with school principals. Nick says, oh, my goodness, that's going to be a disaster. And I said, why? He says, because mm -hmm. what business leaders will do is they will go into schools and they will think that their job is to go and tell people what to do. Mm -hmm. And so we had to create a mm -hmm. program that will almost your ca first character strength is, is what is it? Humility, intellectual yeah. humility, almost infuse intellectual humility because if those business leaders did go with arrogance into the school it would be a disaster yeah. so i've been so struck by by the discoveries that you've made and it's there's so many linkages to, to the work that we've been doing and many other people on the call but it's that how do we because business many people in business have never had the opportunity to discover a different way mm. because you talk in the book about yeah. just not being a jerk and I think a lot of the jerkiness we see in organization is, is leaders who have had really bad examples. So I don't know whether that resonates in any way. Because, but I, I mean, we, we want to talk about those yeah, five yeah. character strengths. I'm just curious resonate. whether any of those resonate. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, that contract that you sign with the organization, often, you know, consciously or unconsciously or even expressly in the contract, it's about you're the expert, you're coming with the answers. And uh, and the reality is that the, the rate at which the world is changing is that none of us have good answers to the problems that are most pressing and persistent. And um, and so we, we, we've got to change that algorithm, you know, um, that it's not about having, it's not about one, you know, it's not about one person being in the room being smarter than everyone else in the room anymore. And I, I, I often find this um, where, <laughs> when I encounter the line manager community, because, um, and if I may, and I'm, I, I do get accused of mansplaining um, and whitesplaining, um, so guilty as charged. Um, this is somewhat data driven, though. Uh, this is what I've heard through empathy and expert interviews with people in the line manager community. But we have in our country, we have, uh, you know, first and second generation line managers, uh, you know, from the context of their community and or executives. And um, and for many of these people, they've been in a very disciplined and steadfast way. They've been, um, you know, following a structured path towards a line manager job. And for some of them, it's taken a couple of decades to get there. And what they've witnessed, to your point, around the examples that have been set, is when you become the line manager or the exec, you become the smartest person in the room. You get to tell everyone what to do. 
And sometimes your sense of self-worth is determined by how many people report to you and how big your budget is. So that is the behavior that they've learned. And then you've got clowns like me who rock up and say, no, no, we should have an egalitarian approach where it's you know, multidisciplinary and a graduate works in a small team with an experienced person and the, the graduate can sometimes take the lead depending on where we are in a problem solving process. And, and again, you, you can't blame people for saying, well, I've been waiting a long time to get to this point in my career. Now you want to take it away from me before it's even begun. And or you want to introduce a whole bunch of change into my world that I understand very well. Um, you want to do different things and you want to do things differently. Um, I don't want to whoopsie on my watch. I've just got you. Uh, I've got lots of people in this organization that don't think I deserve to be here because of my demographic. And I've got people in my community who are looking at me to succeed. And I'm also possibly cross-subsidizing a lot of people from a black tax perspective who uh, are, are unemployed or underemployed um, in, in my community. So I can't afford a whoopsie on my job. So um, I think that's part of the mistake that I made at Standard Bank is um, not being empathetic about that lived experience and perspective of leaders in, in our, in our uh, complex organizations and wanting to bash through with change and play a joker card that says, I've been asked by the, you know, the top, top, top bosses to do this. So uh, I'll ask nicely once, but then after that, you, you must do it, you know? So um, talk about a blood nose. You don't want to pick a fight with six and a half thousand line managers across 24 countries. <laughs> so that's, so, so I just, I, I want to get to this other point, but that's such an important point, Paul, because I mean, we work with school principals. So yesterday I was in a room with a group of school principals mm. and and they said, well, actually, Louise, the, the expectation is that as a principal, I will know and I will tell people. And one of, some of the principals said, we asked, why did you go to, well, there was a business leader who asked him, why did you go to school this morning? You knew we were going to start at 8.30. He said, oh, no, no, you have to go to school. You have to park your car so that they know you there. And so we talked about, well, what is the assumption that's underpinning mm. that? Well, the story is I can't trust them. Mm. If I'm, if my car is not parked, because they park their car and then they take an Uber to the venue. If my car is not there, oh they gosh, will, they will not behave and they won't behave. It's so like one of those cut cardboard cutouts of this. Have you heard about this in the UK where they have the cardboard cutouts of the, um, the, the um, traffic police vehicles? And they put them visibly along the road. So people think there's a real traffic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So we talked about the, what is the assumption, you know, if, you, if that's your assumption, yeah. if you genuinely believe that the 65 educators in your school are useless and cannot do their job and will not do their job when you are mm -hmm. not there. And then one of the principals said, well, I had to learn the hard way that the only way that I was possibly going to create a high performance organization is if I, if I changed that, if I started to believe that they, that they are able to create this. Um, but, but that is, so that story around, I have to, it's all on my shoulders. If yeah. I don't, then no one else will. I'm now in this position, therefore I'm the boss, but you have an acronym. What does HIPPO stand for? Highest paid person's opinion. You know, that's the only one that counts. And the HIPPO in the room is a great, uh, it's a great one frame cartoon. I, I forget the cartoonist name. I'm so sorry, but yeah, it's literally a hippopotamus sitting you know, at a, in a meeting and, and everyone else is kind of pointing at a graph going down and the hippopotamus is saying, we're going to go with option A, which is just continued going down, you know. And then everybody yeah. else is staying quiet because we can't possibly challenge well, this. Well, yes, but I mean, you know, you signs my bonus letter and my, you know, my increase at the end of the year and so on. So, yeah, I mean, again, I think we mustn't be naive about, um, you know, people have bonds to pay and school fees to pay and, uh, you know, they yeah. So HIPAA then leads us to which we, the conversation we're not going to have today because we've just agreed this morning we will have this conversation <laughs> somewhere else, which is around performance management and bonuses and and um, but I want to go to these. So what you've discovered yeah. and what you are the, your your um, invitation to the world is to consider that character is yeah. what matters most, and then you've you've chosen from quite a large character set yeah. five to focus on so i'm interested to know yeah. why those five yeah and then i'm sure many people in the room and i just want to really strongly recommend to everybody if you have not read the book yet this is the book 
Um, and it's with, it's it's short enough to read um, quite quickly, uh, but it's a lovely read. And we're not going to even do justice to this book today. Today is just a teaser. I want you all to go read the book, to buy the book and read the book. But t tell us yeah. about those five characters. Yeah. And why did you choose all characters and why did you choose those five? Oh, okay, characters? cool. Uh, and I've just noticed, uh, thanks for holding up the book, that um, I haven't acknowledged my co-author, Tanya Meeson, who's our research and report writer, Jack Frost, and um, without whom the, this book wouldn't exist. She was absolutely a force majeure behind this book. She's amazing. Um, so thank you, Tanya. Um, so, okay, so maybe again, just maybe a quick half a step back. Why character? So what is character um, and 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 why why have I become interested in it? So uh, my part of the hypothesis in the book is that we have, um, we've used skills and experience as a, as a lazy heuristic to put people into leadership positions. And the problem in our country is that um, we have, uh, you know, skills and experience are often a function of privilege. So if you've been privileged, you've, develop skills and experience, therefore you get the leadership position. Um, we've put in the book a couple of interesting studies. The one is a study of gifted on giftedness by a, a psychologist out of Boston called Ellen Winner. And she tracked these savant children um, over about a 30 year period. So savant children are kind of like at five, they can outperform you know, university PhD graduates in arithmetic, they can play multiple musical instruments, et cetera. And um, and she found five very interesting things, having tracked them for 30 years in their lives. But the one that's relevant to the book is that um, they go on to be very successful in their domain of choice. They go on to be elite leaders in their domain of choice. But what they don't do is they don't bring any change to the domain of choice. They're very good at figuring out the rules of the status quo and then beating everyone else at the game. So um, so that's what happens is when we, we have a bias for skills and experience and or giftedness, uh, 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 we, we don't drive change in, in, in organizations. Because often those who have grown up in privilege don't, you know, are quite vested in the status quo as well. Whether it's conscious or unconscious, they're not going to drive change either. Now, also in our emerging market context, if you look at our BRICS colleagues, we earn much more than our, for, for the equivalent roles in our economy, we earn much more than somebody in India, Russia, China, uh, or Brazil, because we have far less skills in our economy. And I think this creates a God complex. I think that we think we're cooler than we actually are. Um, and God complexes are dangerous. I've suffered one from one many times. So I know how dangerous they are. And they destroy value. They don't create value for everyone. So um, character is something different. Character is built in struggle. It's very universal. It cuts across socioeconomic uh, divides. Um, it's a universal thing. We talk about character strengths. There are three different kinds. Strengths of heart, strengths of um, mind, and strengths of will. So strengths of heart, things like being purpose-driven, being honest, being kind, um, expressing gratitude, um, social and emotional intelligence, um, there are a number of others. Uh, strengths of uh, mind are things like um, um, showing good judgment, making good decisions, curiosity and creativity are actually strengths of mind, interestingly, and intellectual humility, which we've discussed, also strength of mind. Um, and then strengths of will is getting stuff done. So it's grit, swimming against the tide, um, biting down over you know very long periods of time to drive meaningful change, to being driven by passion and perseverance and purpose. Um, other ones are things like growth mindset, uh, being willing to un unlearn things and learn new things to get stuff done, um, self-discipline and uh, proactivity. These are all examples of, of strengths of will. Now, they're wonderfully universal. They're built through struggle. That's why, you know, the Cape Epic exists. You've got all these rich people choosing struggle because actually they want to develop their character. And in our world, we've got tens of millions of people struggling every day. So I think we're a nation full of good character strength. Um, and so I've been thinking, you know, the last part of this puzzle piece is a bit like the Marvel movie universe and putting down a few puzzle pieces here is that um, uh, the, the half-life of our skills, the World Economic Forum has said is five or less years. That was in 2017. So if you've learned something as a leader through your privilege of developing skills and experience, you're on the verge of redundancy from a skill perspective. And skill is not necessarily what we need. If, if, if these skills are becoming redundant so fast in this world, they're not what we need to solve problems. What we need to solve problems is, is, is more character. We need an operating system that's character strength based um, because it's much more robust than a skills and experience based operating system. 
Now, what's interesting about character is that we've been so obsessed with personality as a species and, and, um, and those sorts of things and psychometrics and things that we actually haven't studied character much. Um, but there's this wonderful science emerging. And basically what it shows is character is synonymous with achievement in the real world. Now, that's interesting. And there's a great study called Return on Character, which shows that in the business context, uh, leaders who are rated as having high character, gener out, you know, gen generating you know, 5x the financial returns of in their, for their organizations that leaders uh, of, of low character are generating, they are delivering exponentially higher customer engagement, employee engagement, agility in the, uh, more agile organizations, and they're contributing to the communities that those organizations operate in. So it's a no-brainer. I, I, I think what we've unpacked around, you know, uh, the, the thesis in the book is people of high character in strong relationships drive good change. Um, we've unpacked that since, since starting to write the book. So if, if you, here's what the Lego blocks look like. If, if character, uh, scientifically, there's evidence to show that character drive uh, delivers achievement in the real world. Achievement delivers credibility and credibility delivers trust and trust is the basis of psychological safety and psychological safety delivers change and innovation. <laughs> so that's kind of the formula that we're working with. And um, I like the psychological safety. It's a difficult concept for me to get my head around. Never the smartest kid in the class. And I've been too much time staring out the window. But for me, psychological safety is kind of, there's a poet called David White who um, wrote a poem about friendship. And he basically says, friendship's quite simple. It's um, uh, the secret to a, a lifelong friendship is, uh, are you willing to continually forgive the other person? And are they willing to continually forgive you? So if we are in a world where no one really knows what the answers are, we're going to probably get things wrong more than we get them right in terms of solving. Are we able to forgive each other through that problem solving process? For me, that's kind of what psychological safety is. It's a friendship of mutual and ongoing forgiveness. And, um, and, and so that's why I'm so excited about character. I think that's what, what modern organizational cultures need to be made of. So let's talk about them very quickly. I think we're probably running out of time. No, we're running out of So okay. what we do, just so that okay. it does, okay. I'm going to ask, um, so so Paul's going to talk about these five character strengths, why he chose them specifically for the book. He did say in the book he's going to continue to talk about others <laughs> over time. I'm not sure where that's going to go. Okay. But, um, and then we want to invite you to ask, we've got a few questions already, which we'll come to, okay. but we want to hear those five, and then we're going to hear from Paul. Okay. Um, I have some questions for you, Paul, but we'll okay. stop it. Okay, well, let's go quickly. So, wow, VDE, your coffee is really good. Um, okay, so intellectual humility, we've discussed. No one person is smarter than everyone else in the room. But I don't think we should, we should, we should skip, rush, over. skip over that one, because that one, okay. in my mind is the most important of all of them. Yes, and it kind of, of experience. It, it, so just, it talks a little bit to what you're saying about, what was the man, man's name? Just want to make me burst into salsa dancing that I can't do. Ricardo, it wasn't Ricardo Semler. Uh, no, no, Santiago. no, Santiago. He wrote Inconguilardo. a book called, um, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll find it for you. But anyway. Yeah. So, um, well, intellectual humility is, um, it, 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 for me, it's two things. So in design thinking, we say it's a game of two halves. Design thinking is a problem-solving process that uh, tries to put the humans that are going to benefit from the solution at the center of the, um, the problem-solving effort. Um, it's more than that. It also talks about beyond desirability, feasibility, viability, and, um, and increasingly sustainability. But anyway, um, so it's partly, uh, you know, getting everyone's answer to the question out and sifting through all of those answers and quilting together an answer that no one person could have come up with there on their own, but is stronger than any answer that one person could have come up with. But it's also about falling back in love with the problem space. So in design thinking, game of two halves, you first fall back in love with the problem, understand it from multiple perspectives, build a bit of tension there and use that to launch into the solutioning space. As we discussed earlier, we all been paid to come with the answer. So we, we don't do the Einstein thing of if you gave me a problem and an hour to solve it, I spend 59 minutes understanding the problem, one minute solving. We do 59 minutes, shoot, 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 solve, solve, being solve. Being clever. Well, you know, then, posturing. Yeah, That's and then the really last minute thing. realizing we haven't aimed yeah. at the right thing. Yeah. So, um, so intellectual humility applies both to the solutioning space and the problem space. So intellectual humility is about, do I really understand the problem? Are we solving the right problem? 
so that's intellectual. Yeah, I can. We can spend a whole day talking about yeah, intellectual yeah. humanity. We won't. We will. We will yeah. probably. So, yeah. so watch the space. Who knows where yeah. this might come? Yeah. And then the others. Yeah. Okay, grit's probably my favorite. It's one of the strengths of will. You're not allowed to have favorites, um, but it is my favorite. There's a book by Angela Duckworth um, called Grit, and check it out. It's magnificent. It's basically a series of chapters where she does case studies on how gritty people who weren't the most talented in their domain went on to drive meaningful change in their domain. And so I like to say the tagline for grit is talent is for losers. Um, because often talented people, it's too easy for them to succeed and they don't actually build grit muscles. And so they don't actually push through and drive change. And um, and so back to that African adage, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Gritty people are good at, at going far and, and hopefully with some social and emotional intelligence bringing along others. And and the thing with grit is that, I mean, every single person you've just said, uh, start up as, you know, nine years of grit. Yeah. That's what it is. And I think people give up too quickly. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm watching this with, with my children and their friends, how quickly, no, no, I can't find a solution. It is something that we really need to learn how to infuse mm. in people. So yes, we can spend a whole day talking about grit. We, next time we'll just do the whole session just yeah, on uh, one of these characters. And it's one of the things, you know, this whole um, philosophy of fail fast, you know, it, it, that's an interesting then we need to talk about this more because yeah on on if you something if, if something feels quite if you're driven by purpose and you're very passionate that whole fail fast thing doesn't count it's uh it applies to more like little experiments that are, are, are a portfolio of things that you're trying to pursue that that overall southern cross that you're pursuing from a purpose perspective other centeredness is kind of our cheat tanya and i kind of came up with this thing that we wanted to pack a whole bunch of <laughs> uh character strengths underneath but essentially it's um maybe a little bit of this uh empathy kind of thing um putting yourself in other people's shoes understanding things from other people's perspectives and um, and i i think that um this is something we could all get better at doing as as leaders yeah so sure. and and peter so this has been this is this is the connection that I made with all of our work with peter block and all of our work with partners possibility is this kind of say servant leadership and it's the and I yes. think that's where the Ubuntu yeah. connection is yeah. very strong. Okay. Um, and and you know Ben Zander who said that the only musician on the stage who doesn't make a sound is the is the conductor. Yeah. And so there's so much, so many connections to this idea. But that's what I don't I, I see that people struggle to be other centered because they're so anxious in. In themselves and they said so there's a there's there's stuff that we need to do to enable people to be other centered because if they are so stressed out and so anxious it's hard and yeah. i do think that's a massive kind of unlocker of value. I, I agree and i think part of the kind of living other centeredness is recognizing that we have a very strong reptilian element to our brains we all have a fight flight and freeze yeah. and when we're under enormous amount of pressure with all the risk in the macro environment and politics in these um inside these organizations and you know all the other stuff that's happening in the world you know the south african african and, and uh, geopolitical environment it's not surprising that we sometimes just get a bit selfish and interestingly we haven't discussed the definition of character which is things you do to serve yourself and others so um, that's the definition that i like the most and i've stolen it from the character lab who you should check out um, and I spoke to um, David and Julie in the breakout room. They're doing great work to help um, teachers infuse opportunities for children to learn to build their character strengths as part of their learning journeys at school and um, check them out online. But um, so, yeah, other centeredness is, I think that's partly, we, I'm also guilty of maybe swinging too far about either doing too many things for myself and not enough for others or too many things for others and not enough for myself. It's a very hard thing it's to a, get. It's difficult to hold the balance, but I think yeah. certainly in our work, we find that that that's work that's worth paying attention to. Yeah. As the, you know, we just did this five week course or process with um, it um, it's go skate to mark, and oh, okay. there's a very strong link to that as well. So for me, there's what your book did, did for me was kind of bringing many different threads together, and yeah. I think there's an opportunity for us as practitioners to start to bring our different in the same you know in the design thinking way bring our 
um, different perspectives to this. So maybe we can invite you to do a design thinking process on a theory of organizations, which we can all contribute That'll to. That'll be amazing. That will be amazing. Be Craig, amazing. are you paying attention? <laughs> okay, two more. Gra growth, okay, and then growth, I want to hear other Growth mindset. Um, yeah, actually, you mentioned Craig and the story of Beowulf. That is uh, that is the um, courage to to let go of all your certainty and all your skills and experience and step into the problem and solutioning space, um, you know, um, in a very vulnerable and awkward way, and often in a very visible way. Um, so, uh, yeah, are you willing to unlearn things and learn new things? And, uh, and uh, yeah, I just think absolutely important for the world that we're in now. I mean, everything we've, <laughs> we've known and are good at has created an enormous mess, an enormous mess. So we've got to learn new things and we're going to let go of all of that other stuff. Sure, there's some stuff that yeah, absolutely we should hold on to. But um, um, And then, you know, I've, I've mentioned uh, empathy and uh, other centeredness, but we've also pulled it out, um, you know, from almost like an emotional and social intelligence perspective. And, um, and it's because we're kind of very enamored with the um, potential of design thinking, which is a very simple and problem solving process. I remember explaining it to my eight year old daughter when I first came across it and I sat her down and I said, you know, that this was a moment in her childhood that I, I needed to share this big epiphany that I'd had with her. And I explained how design thinking works to her. And she looked at me uh, and she said, well, if that's how you solve problems now, how did you used to solve problems? <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. I said, I don't want to talk about it. Go to your room, you're grounded. <laughs> No, of course I didn't do that. But um, but yes, I think that um, empathy is um, uh, yeah. Is, as I said, it's all it's all about falling back in love with the problem and understanding it from lots of other people's perspectives. Yeah. So so I want to share with you because I was just thinking I have to say this to my daughter. My daughter is twenty five. Unfortunately, couldn't join this call, but she would so love to hear you talk. So we're going to have to create another, well, she'll, she'll listen to the, to the podcast and then hopefully there'll be another opportunity. So I hope you are all as enamored as I am uh, with, with this conversation. Uh, we have some questions. Um, so <laughs> Craig, uh, Craig is just sp um, owned up to the fact that he, but I think you did say that in the book as well, the mm -hmm. Beowulf and the Gr Grendel and Grendel's mother story. Yeah. But he says, we just have to remember that it came from David Wyatt's Heart Aroused. Okay. So Craig, um, uh, did you want to say any, I mean, you had, a, you had, Craig had another question, which I think mm -hmm. is really important. And maybe this is a good question for us to go to next. He says, on the great Jack Frost journey, what were the siren calls that were best avoided and which detours attract and how did you hold the path? This is always, this is usually why I only see Craig over a glass of wine or something, um, because that uh, yeah, I feel my hard drive is already spinning, and if I was on a Mac, I could see that spinning wheel of rainbow death. Um, I mean, maybe if I just want to paraphrase my understanding of the questions, maybe like what are the hard lessons that I've learned um, um, building Jack Frost? Um, So many, so many. Um, I think w one of the things that uh, it's it's been a a feast of humble pie. I mean, I've had so much humble pie. I've said to the universe, "This is not what I ordered. <laughs> Why does the kitchen keep bringing me another one of these?" And it just keeps bringing more and more humble pie. So I think that um, you know, recognizing that the the. We, we've chosen a, a a tough gig, but I think I think OE is a tough gig. And, um, and, um, yeah, I think, I think, as I said earlier, you know, figuring out what is it that our clients need from us and what are they willing to pay for and what are we excited to deliver and feel purposeful about, um, delivering and where do those Venn diagrams overlap? That has been hard. You know, I, I think that I have been a slow learner and I've pushed things that they weren't ready for. They didn't want too often. And, um, and, you know, so, and all they've wanted, but they haven't had the money to pay for and things like that. So, um, especially when you're pushing things that are new to the market, um, it's sometimes hard to find early adopters because you're asking them to take a risk 
in their career and with their relationships at work and uh, and for all the reasons that I described earlier. I think I didn't have enough empathy for um, their perspective on, on, on what we were selling. So that's probably the biggest thing. And then the other thing is just business model. You know, you have to, you, you have to make sure that you, 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 you the shocks like COVID it was something I didn't factor in, you know, when I, when I left Standard Bank, uh, I sometimes think, well, maybe I should have just taken a job in, in, in the, in the investment banking side of the business. And then, you know, I would have had more of a balance sheet to deal with those kind of shocks. So I, I think even in, the, even living in the innovation space and constantly telling the, everyone else how quickly the world's changing and, and how likely it is that we're going to have black swan events and things like that, but not actually planning for it in my own world um, in, a, in a meaningful way was, is also, is also, it's also been a hard lesson. I have a question, mm -hmm. which just kind of is fueled by what you just said. It's mm -hmm. a conversation that we had this morning. It's knowing that Cecil is on the call. Because I wonder whether when we do something as difficult as what you are trying to do, and I think I can certainly speak to mm -hmm. a very similar, you know, choosing a difficult path, mm -hmm. Isn't it time for us to take what we're talking about in terms of change in organizations into this space? So my theory of now, it's many years of getting to this point. My theory now is we're going to do great work together when we have great relationships with each other. Mm. And that the work that we have to do, which might or might not lead to, to, to paid work, mm. For us, and in this con conversation, yeah. is about our relationships with each other. So this yeah. is why... I just think we can do a, we can all do a better job of creating that community of people yeah. who have strong relationships and and support each other when there is no kind of money to be made. But then when the opportunity comes to make the money, we will. Well, the the I, I maybe the last lesson that I've learned, and thanks for the question, Craig, is that I I my, when my reptilian brain kicks in, I I default to busyness. I think that busyness is going to pay the bills because I've got this uh, tape that plays in my head that if you're working hard, you you earn money. But what I found during COVID was that I was this little tree out in a massive storm uh, on its own and it took a battery. Whereas I think what you're talking about, connection over task, and almost if we could form some kind of metaphorical forest, we could be feeding nutrients to each other, you know, emotionally, spiritually, otherwise but also leads and collaborating on projects and um but also with our clients you know we had a conversation this absolutely. morning around i think that if our clients know that we are interested and care about them as human beings when there is no project or proposal to be written but it's just about connecting mm -hmm. as human when the opportunity comes for the project or the proposal they'll talk come to us because yep because we have been nurturing that relationship over many years. And I think that's the, that's the challenge, Sifli, is how do we create this sense of community and, and with our clients, even there's no income to be generated from that, but in time then, hopefully yeah, that trust. will lead to some I trust. It is, it is about trust. And you write about trust yeah. the whole book. So I want to now, because we're running out of time, I want to open the microphone. If anybody wants to speak to Paul, and all you need to do is unmute your your microphone, and we're gonna we're gonna have about ten or fifteen minutes or so, just hearing some voices and hear Paul's responses. Now, come on, guys, this is an amazing group of people. You're not normally all that quiet. <laughs> um, so, anybody who wants to be brave and open the microphone and ask a question, Lee, no, yeah. Lee. <laughs> no, yeah. Yes, I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, so firstly, thank you so much, Paul and Louise. Lovely to meet you as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm the head of HR at a company, and I previously did a course in compassion cultivation through Stanford University. I'm all about wow. empathy. It's something I just, I had very big dreams about just taking, you know, training companies how to like use compassion to like solve all the problems. It was the silver <laughs> bullets. And I still, yeah. to a large extent, actually do believe, yeah. legit, it is a yeah. silver bullet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there, there's no like, you know, catch. But as the head of HR, I found myself in a space where it's like I'm banging my own drum. And I suppose the question I really have is how do you influence people or where do people learn all these different things other than like from your book and following people or going, finding a coach or going on training, like, 
what is the best way to instill this A, awareness, and B, this buy-in? Because for anyone in the HR space, you will know they want to see what is the return on the investment. Yeah. And, um, and, and in this case, it's not necessarily an invest, well, it's an energy investment, but it's not a cost investment. How do we actually teach yeah. people about grit and empathy other than role modeling it? Greatly. So we need, no, no, you go, and I'm going to also respond, but I want to hear you first. So, Lee, the, so yeah, I, uh, I can deeply empathize with the journey that you're on. Um, I don't have the I don't have the answers, but I can tell you some of the things that I, the, some of the mistakes that I've made and what what I've learned from those. Uh, the first one is patience. Just be just be patient, and you you can you can push for the change when the time is right, and sort of step back. And it's it's a series of battles. It's not one big war that has to be won in a flick of a switch, um, and it's going to take time. The other good thing is that there is, as I mentioned at Speed, there is a wonderful study that the Harvard Business Review published called Return on Character um, by an author called Dr. Fred Keel. And that's where you can go and get some really good um, evidence about uh, the business case for operating as a high character leader. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, and, and, the, you know, the, the more the science uh, starts producing robust evidence that um, this is something worth um, taking seriously, I think the easier those conversations will become. But you're doing the right thing. You, what it sounds like you're doing, and I'm you're preaching to the converted here, it sounds like modern leadership that you're kind of pushing for. And, uh, and, and yeah, potentially you are right. It could be a, a, a silver bullet. So Lee. I, I have a slightly different perspective on this. And I think part of what, what is worth us doing for the next 30 years of our careers is to get really clear about our own theory of change here. Mm -hmm. So I think people are bombarded with stuff and bombarded with data. And all this. They have to feel some pain. And it's when they feel the pain, when you go, oh, here's an opening. Mm -hmm. So I do feel that people get really interested in this when they when all the traditional stuff they've tried in the past isn't working anymore mm -hmm. and there isn't working shows up in different things the projects don't get delivered we get we people lose we get high levels of engagement quiet quitting resignation all of that stuff and that's where the interest is and then by that time they need to know that we are there and care and we've been grappling with the stuff so i i am um, lee join out so i want to just quickly issue an invitation here to everybody uh, we have a number of um, communities, different WhatsApp groups where we are continuously grappling with these things. I'm putting my, my phone number in the chat here. And uh, please send, if you want to join the African Leadership Group uh, conversation, which is which is where we many of us are, just send a WhatsApp message to my phone number. I've just put my phone number in the chat. Uh, we will continue to have these conversations. I commit to have at least five conversations about each of these five character strengths. If we can get time in Paul's diary, yeah. it's very busy. <laughs> but um, over the next, you know, five or six months, we'll have a once a month, we'll have a conversation about one of these character strengths. Paul, are, you, are we in? He says yes. So I um, hope you all heard that he said yes here. Yeah. Um, and then we're going to invite all of the voices around these. And we're going to give ourselves two hours and we're going to hear what you bring. And then we're going to hear what everybody else brings. Because I think if we can start to tap into what everybody else is, has offers, is offering here. Um, so thanks for that question, Lee. And thanks for getting us going. Uh, we have about five or so minutes left for conversations before we go into appreciation. So anybody else want to say something, ask a question, make a comment? James. Paul, firstly, personal appreciation for, for you and what you bring. This is a comment as much as a question, but, but I sense in your experience, in where you're at, a wonderful tension of our time. And, and somehow it lies in what you've just been describing as your persistent humble pie experiences of really trying to get what is being asked of you, of us now by the world and, and all your references to humility and empathy and all of that. 
um, which I relate to very strongly. But then understanding when you write a book and you put it out into the world, you've got to have certain stuff on the cover. But when I look at the subtitle of your cover, yeah. you know, superpower, drive, growth, innovation itself. And this is my big thought of the moment. I'm also an innovation person. I know we need nothing more in this time than innovation. Amen. But what's just struck me in listening to you now is, is my connection to innovation not part of my problem? You know, that there is an arrogance in innovation. Change oh, yeah. is coming. Change is, is emerging from the yeah. realities that we're in and our challenge is to connect mm -hmm. to those impulses for inevitable change and, mm -hmm. and support. So, so that's my big and thank you for it. Yeah. But connecting me to innovation in a whole new way, is that yeah. not a part of our obsessive, yeah. well, our inability to disconnect from yeah. our superpower notions? Thanks yeah. very much. I've appreciated yeah. James, maybe just very quickly, I think that unconsciously, I'm not a religious person, but I, I, I think that in many religions that we've created as a species, there's this notion that... Um, you know, man is man and woman created in the image of God and God is a creator. Um, and so we're all kind of innovators by default. But I think that unconsciously we're all resentful of these innovators because often they do show up as arrogant kind of polar neck wearing, uh, I'm better than you type folk. But over and above that, the unconscious part is that um, they're creating all this bloody change that we're having to kind of reconcile and navigate because they're not just take a breath and give us a chance to just catch up and take stock. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that at a, that at a cellular level, there's a deep, <laughs> likely a deep resentment towards the topic. Um, and so we all enjoy the, um, the fruits of some of this innovation, but, but arguably it's also um, stressing the hell out of, well, I can say for myself, it's too much. <laughs> Too much, and uh, but it's because it's in our DNA. We uh, there's a part of our species, a subset of our species. I call them the puzzle junkies who just keep solving, 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 new, 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 novel, 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 and um, and so yeah. I, I just want to acknowledge what you're saying. I think that um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I think that um, that from a branding perspective, innovators have got some work to do. <laughs> They're better, and, and maybe some explaining to do. Um, and I mean, if you just look at what's happening in the AI space uh, 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 and, and the, just the rate at which uh, the impact of technology is influencing the planet and our species, uh, you know, exponentially relative to any other time in history. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, James. And that, nice to meet you. So we believe that um, we have to, that, that, that human beings need a ratio of five to one appreciation to criticism in order to think well. And I saw in your book that mm. you did uh, refer to the Gottmans, mm. uh, who also uh, have mentioned that before. And so we want Paul to leave uh, feeling appreciated from the school. <laughs> so I am now going to ask for at least five people to say the words, not just on what's on, not, not just in text, and he's getting all stressed out here. Um, but that's fine because we need to learn how to hear appreciation. So I want five people to express appreciation to Paul, please. So just unmute yourself and I'll give you a chance to speak. And don't hold back. We're not that kind of group. We say what we want to appreciate. Come on. Okay. Well, I'll start <laughs> while people are kind of faffing around. So, Paul, I love, I have loved, loved, loved this conversation. I've loved every conversation mm -hmm. I've had with you. I'm so happy that Craig mentioned to you that you've written me to that you've written the book. And um, it's just been a great privilege. I'm kind of looking at my community saying, why are you not unmuting yourself, guys, and saying something? But there you go. Robin's going to say something in a minute. So, I have loved this conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed every conversation we've had in the last little while, only a small while. And I cannot wait for our conversations about each of these character strings. Mm -hmm. And I feel privileged to be, uh, to, 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 we, we're developing a friendship. I can't call you my friend yet, but I'm definitely going to. That's Absolutely. where I'm heading. Thank you. So delighted. Why that you forgiving me for a long time? <laughs> <laughs> um, Robin and Dean Rennell. 
Hi, Paul. Firstly, thanks so much. This session was incredible. Um, I work in the legal space and there's a lot of thinking around legal design um, coming out of design theory and design thinking. Nice and on. yeah, no, so that's, it's really exciting to hear your, um, you know, the, the various strengths and the various um, topics that you've raised because nobody needs humble thinking more than lawyers and nobody <laughs> needs innovation more than lawyers. Um, and that sense of being other centered, putting the client first. And it's just everything you've said today has really resonated with me, both on a personal and a professional level. And I just want to thank you for the vulnerability that you've shown in answering all our questions. So thanks so much. Thank you, Robin. And lovely to meet you. Thank you. So Robin is in that liminal space. She is changing her. She's moving from being a lawyer to who knows exactly wow. what the future might look like. Sure, she got married to a, to a man who lives in the UK and she's going to live half her life, half her life in the UK and half in South Africa. Wow. And she's figuring out and it's not an easy path. And if there's ever a person who's on the similar journey to many of us, Robin, we are, um, we are long, we are walking this road with you. So I think you, one of those Thank people you. who can say, you have benefited from being on the African leadership group because you've made all sorts of connections that you probably wouldn't have made before. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thanks, Thank Robin. Thank you um, so much. Brunel, you've got unmuted mm -hmm. and then we'll go to Tommy. Okay. Hi, Paul. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed um, the, the, the part where you kicked off and, and uh, told your story. And I think oh, <laughs> um, what also resonated with me is when it's being humble and vulnerable enough to actually also share and talk openly about the, the let's call it the failures, the less successful activities yeah, yeah, yeah. in corporate world when you yeah. f employed full time and that. So I've been on my my own for the last seven ten years, um, wow. and, and um, yeah, so lots of ups and downs throughout the process. Um, and um, in in terms of what you put in your book and how you you engage with content and engage with us, um, I'm very appreciative. So I connected with so now. many things that you said and yeah it would be lovely to unpack each of those and and talk talk to it uh, and uh, share, you know, so thanks thanks Renal, and th thanks so much for those kind words and yeah i'd love to hear more about your story and and maybe learn some of the lessons that have kept you going for 17 years <laughs> that's a remarkable achievement so Renal, we are going to say i think i've just decided this just in response to you saying you're not allowed to join any of our conversations about character strengths if you haven't read peter's paul's book if you know if, if someone's going to have to push this book i'm going to do it because seriously we need some pushing of this book man uh tommy we'd love to hear from you Tommy. yeah i'm a i'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan of paul eh? <laughs> Thanks, Tommy. So, so, so you must you must know it, Paul, that I had a meeting, another committee meeting, and I said to the guys, I'm just gonna present my thing, and then I need to exit the meeting because I didn't tell him about this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but Tommy, yeah, I love I love how naughty you can be. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah, Paul, thanks for this. Um, and uh, I know you said you're not so religious, but you, you remind me of, uh, of of a pastor. And I've been working with you now for 14 months. Every time I hear you, uh, you always bring newness to, to the conversation. And I think that's, that's what makes you one of the thought-provoking leaders in, in, in an essay. Um, I think you, yeah, you should become more to the fore and become, or learn, what's the name? Louise, uh, who's the presenter of this? Um, yes, Louise, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, she must maybe market you more in terms of <laughs> uh, a thought leader in, in ESSO. Uh, because this is a conversation that will propel us as, yeah. as a nation and as an economy. Um, Thanks, Tommy. Authentic, authentic conversations and, and, and how to build this, uh, this, this character. Um, because I think that's, that's what's going to get us out of our current context and situation in SA as well. Uh, we need more leaders like you. So so thanks for leading Thank us then, showing us the way, Paul. Okay. 
Thank you, Tommy. I'm, 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 I'm very grateful. I just want to declare to everyone the book. Tommy's one of the leaders that I studied uh, in writing the book, and uh, and he's part of the evidence that uh, it, it, you know is is encapsulated in the book around there are people like this in the world doing stuff, and Tommy's one of them, um, driving amazing change from within the belly of the AECR beast. So, Tommy, yeah, thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it, and thanks for for being part of the inspiration to write the book. So with that, I think we've come to the end of this conversation, the first of many conversations to be continued, where we will invite many others to contribute their thinking about these particular character strengths, and then it will probably continue into others. So thank you, Paul. Loved thank having you. you. Thank you, everybody, for being you. on the call. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful long weekend if you're lucky enough to have one. And uh, yeah, thanks again for your time and your interest. It was really a pleasure. Love today. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Thanks.